My name's Ian Enting. I'm from the um, inelegantly named ARC Centre of Excellence in Mathematics and Statistics of Complex Systems here at the University of Melbourne. Uh, but um, a lot of what I'm talking about, my interesting guy, goes back to my um, previous position, carbon cycle modelling with CSIRO. Primary interest in talking about uh, James Lovelock uh, to a more general audience is what the Gaia hypothesis, which um, in its earliest form uh, is roughly as I've written it there. Um, the idea that the Earth acts like a living organism, that life acts to stabilise the physical and chemical environment to maintain the planet as a habitat suitable for life. Um, as a working scientist, my first question, is this true? Or even before that, what does it actually mean? And there is a lot of ambiguity in that, which um, one has to acknowledge in Lovelock's writings. I don't think it disqualifies him as a key thinker, but one does always have to come to grips with the, the ambiguity. The other aspect that has had me thinking very much about Gaia, and the question, is it science or mysticism, or something in between, is the challenges to the science of the greenhouse effect, which has been a um, politically contested matter. I actually wrote a book out about that's available outside, but not primarily the topic of this talk, but it is um, what had me really thinking seriously um, using um, the Gaia hypothesis, an example of the nature of science. How do you define what is sound science, what is conceivably scientific, what really lies outside the domain of science. So I'm going to cover this lot of things of necessity. It's going to be fairly brief. Um, talk a little bit about, about the context in which these ideas have evolved, um, the emerging science of the Earth system. It's, so I've been working as part of that for um, almost three decades now. Um, the Gaia hypothesis, where it came from, into Lovelock's thinking, what it says, how it's been developed. To put it in perspective, um, talk about contested ideas, some examples of scientific um, ideas that have been subject to contest. I'm mainly going to do ones that proved, out, proved to be true in the end, and put that in the perspective of other types of contested knowledge. Uh, look at the challenges um, to Gaian theory. They claim that it's non-Darwinian. Um, particular Richard Dawkins' view on this. Um, talk about the observational evidence. Um, Lovelock's influence on science and beyond science. The latter I don't really want to drill on. I think it's, for me, the less interesting part. And then the implications. If it is true, what does this imply about our response to global warming? So over the last 50 years, 60 years, the science of the Earth system has evolved rapidly. Most areas of science have evolved rapidly. Atmospheric science has developed, in particular, the um, capability for numerical weather forecasting, with numeric, NWP, numerical weather prediction, um, the dynamics of the atmosphere. It's become a reality all around the world on a daily basis. Um, atmospheric chemistry, which is more related to what I worked on, has become a, an emerging discipline decades ago now, but um, it's been you know, part of the emergence. Physical, chemical and biological oceanography and the interrelations between those. Uh, the earth sciences, geology, linking to geophysics, seismology and so on. The life sciences, the discovery of the structure of DNA and all that flowed from it. And then ultimately the linking of all these different fields, which is um, the real context in which we need to talk about Gaia. Some of the things that drove that were improved instrumentation, a lot of World War II technology and the spin-off from that. The massive growth in computing power, I mean, um, the memory stick, wherever I put it, has something like 50 times the capacity that was shared among all CSRO scientists on their main computer at the site I first worked on. Uh, satellite observations, daily measurements, down on scales, down to 25 metres square, covering the whole world, perhaps several times a month. Um, and that's just the civilian stuff. Uh, what the military stuff does is um, rather more obscure. 
and the fact that this has taken place in a time of relative peace, there's been technological competition, military fields that's spun off into civilian applications, allowed an incredible degree of um, international collaboration and that's been for me one of the joys of working in this particular area, um, being able to collaborate with people from all around the world. Um, the the um, non-controversial part of Lovelock's influence is his instrumentation work. The fact that he developed very sensitive detectors for trace gases, and particularly chlorofluorocarbons, so sensitive that his funding proposal rejected as being just impossible, could, can't be done, this guy's a crank, um, so he went off and did it. His, his first instrument that he took down to the South Atlantic and showed that the compounds were persisting in the atmosphere um, long enough to make it from northern to the southern hemisphere, actually ultimately it ended up at CSIRO and started off their CS, CFC measurement program with my um, former colleague and running partner, Paul Fraser. Um, and when Lovelock visited uh, last, uh, CSIRO in Aspendale last year, they actually pulled out the original instrument and that's... James Lovelock and Paul Fraser with Lovelock's original instrument still. Uh, side effect of this, um, these developments was it provided enough royalties to enable him to largely work as an independent scientist, as he puts it, for most of his career. Getting back to the Earth system, this is one of probably the strongest example of a tight coupling between life, chemistry and climate. The... Um, Data from the Vostok ice core, several kilometres long drilled in the centre of the Antarctic, the Russian Vostok station, basically is chosen to be as far away from the coast as you can be in any direction. Um, what it plots up the top, uh, do I get a, I do get a, of sorts, is the temperatures, this is estimated from the properties of the ice, the ice isotopic ratios, the carbon dioxide concentration measured in tiny bubbles and the methane. Um, what I've done, which is rather different to most presentations of these data, is I've plotted the gas roughly on the scale of how much warming you would expect them to produce. So you see methane, you would expect to be producing a small part of this warming and cooling um, cycle, carbon dioxide about half. Um, this is a very complicated relation. It's not, the mechanisms aren't fully understood. It's certain, almost certainly, virtually certainly due to storage of carbon in the ocean. Um, one of the things that's been known by the scientists working in this field is that the temperature changes that started off from the Earth's orbit, changes in the amount of radiation that reaches the Earth at particular times, particular high northern latitudes, allowing ice to accumulate from one year to the next, probably, gives you a temperature change that tends to affect plant growth, respiration, and affect the amount of CO2, and that in turn amplifies the warming. So the gas changes, especially on the decreasing side, and um, I think remember is this is age back in time. So this is the present end, the recent end. And this is the um, almost half a million years old end. That the cooling stage, definitely the temperature happens first. Um, Al Gore used these in his book and got into a lot of trouble. He just said it's complicated left the impression that it was the gases were the sole cause of the temperature, which is certainly the science you write from the beginning wasn't correct and was duly criticised. In a sense, he should have either left it out or put in a paragraph of explaining it, um, whatever. What it does is the fact that the involvement of the gases do give an explanation of why small changes in the Earth's orbit can actually um, cause that much temperature change. What he has done, I guess early 80s, is he's made a distinction what he, the earlier what he calls the Gaia hypothesis, which is what I threw up before, that the plant, um, uh, plant and animal life on the, on the Earth, and meaning primarily microbial, really, regulating the physical and chemical components of the Earth's system to maintain the planet as a habitat for life. Um, he later uses the term Gaia theory, to say the combined physical, chemical and biological system is self-regulating it, keeps the um, enhanced stability of the Earth. Uh, so from, this is not the usual way that scientists and philosophers of science would um, use the words hypothesis and theory. Um, Lovelock, I think, I think in Vanishing Face, a guy, is fairly explicit that part of this shift 
was to deal with criticisms of um, particular Richard Dawkins taking it into a larger domain. I mean, this is both bad, it's just like running away from your critics, but it's also good because I think this is actually what has to be done. Um, I think the real answer lies in that, that Lovelock's right, the first version is untenable, the second version um, exceedingly interesting. Lovelock got the idea when he was involved working at Jet Propulsion Lab in California on the NASA mission, Viking mission to Mars, primarily aimed at to trying to detect life on Mars. And so the question was, how do you go about doing this? Um, Lovelock's idea was you could actually look at the composition of the atmosphere. Uh, the distinguishing thing, property, life, property that um, life on Earth caused in the atmosphere, is you have the simultaneous presence of methane and oxygen. Without a continuous biological production of methane, uh, with this much oxygen, the um, methane will disappear in a few decades. Um, it's only that it's um, continually produced by natural systems and also by human activities, which are now slightly greater than the amount in natural, um, natural systems. So we actually have, so what's it? Probably human activity is about one and a half times natural, so we actually have um, one and a half times more methane than the pre-industrial data, the data that showed at the end of the Vostok ice core. Um, just to clarify, those ice core data weren't showing the present increases because those numbers are averaged over 500 years because that's how fast the bubbles get trapped. Anyway, getting back to um, Lovelock's ideas, at essentially the time he came up with it, it was just before or just after, effectively September 65, a French group um, from a high altitude mountain telescope were actually able to measure the spectra of light from Venus and Mars and in particular showed that these atmospheres were in chemical equilibrium and so Lovelock's conclusion was okay, no life on Mars, uh, you don't have to send a spacecraft there, which is not what NASA really wanted to hear, but um, there was breaks. And of course they sent the spacecraft and um, it didn't find life and uh, subsequent spacecraft haven't either. The question of whether there was life on Mars in the past is still open. There's certainly um, detailed mapping, photographic mapping, shows features that look very much like they were created by liquid water and uh, raised the possibility that in the past um, Mars did have life. Some of the things that happened, he worked with um, Lynn Margulis in um, uh, Boston University, I think, uh, the early 70s, certainly emphasising the fact that most of the action is in the um, microbial domain, that it's microbes that do all the different types of chemi chemistry. Some of them actually live under the ocean, living off a sulphur cycle, Others, um, especially in our guts to some extent, definitely the guts of termites and ruminant animals, uh, give off methane. Uh, plants, of course, take up CO2 and give off oxygen, and um, well, we're users of oxygen. The, um, as I said, he um, developed more the joint regulation of the biological and physical chemistry. Uh, regulation in the 1980s in response to Dawkins uh, and others. The Daisy World model, which I haven't really got time to talk about um, in spite of my colleagues' encouragement, a uh, simple model of how a planet could self-regulate with different biological systems responding differently to the environment. Another major step was what's called the CLAW hypothesis, which is named after an acronym from the author's names, uh, Charlson, Lovelock, Andre and Warren suggesting that um, algae in the ocean surface regulate the climate by product producing dimethyl sulphide, uh, gas that's given off into the atmosphere, oxidised to sulphate, uh, forming particles in which cloud, cloud drops condense, increasing the cloudiness, cooling the um, atmosphere. One of the very definite discoveries that's sort of driven by thinking in Gaian terms. Uh, the other one that Lovelock puts a lot of Scopin is a very, a very high, large multidisciplinary conference uh, in Amsterdam 2001 accepted the idea of self-regulation of the Earth system. Um, so a little, little footnote. Um, the word search for life on Earth in the Galileo spacecraft 
is actually the title of a paper published in Nature by Carl Sagan and others. What happens, um, this Galileo Leo spacecraft was heading off to Jupiter, it's an artist impression, the craft superimposed on the planet there, that such spacecraft get the energy by doing gravitational assist from the inner planets. So uh, Galileo flew past Venus, picked up a bit of en extra energy, came past Earth, picked up a bit more energy, headed off into the asteroid belt and got, came back to Earth two years later on this elongated elliptical orbit and picked up enough energy then to go out to Jupiter. And on one of those Earth flybys in 1991, actually they turned their instruments back out on the Earth. They called it a control experiment for detecting life and it duly confirmed the, that you could from space check that the atmosphere did have oxygen and methane you know, proportions that were way out of chemical equilibrium. Uh, Calling a control experiment is a nice story. In practice, it was more symbolic, um, an acknowledgement of Lovelock to some extent, and to some extent an instrument test. But just a little footnote. Thinking about the challenges to Lovelock in a context of contested ideas, and I sort of came up with this categor categorization of different disputes that come, some of them over science. On occasion, the straight up politicised denial. Um, on the denial of history, there's actually a fine book by Tony Taylor from Monash, published by Melbourne University Press, um, called History Betrayed, that gives half a dozen examples of this. Um, uh, there's obviously a strong relig primarily religiously based campaign against the reality of Darwinian evolution. Again, an industry based um, campaign uh, denying the dangers of smoking, and uh, I would agree with Alan Gore that a lot of what happens in terms of discussing human induced, disputing human induced climate change is in the same category as that. Slightly different categories conspiracy theories. It's also pseudoscience, as I said, this seems to be a mix of individual obsession, obsession desire to make a quick buck. Eric von Daniken, you know, Spaceships of the God, if for those who are old enough to remember that, for those who are even older, Emmanuel Velikovsky trying to with planetary orbits to explain all the um, odd events in the early books of the Bible. Um, many examples in the health field of pseudoscience. Another fine book, uh, Counter Knowledge by Damien Thompson, talks about those, a little bit of um, uh, pseudo history stuff as well. Pathological science, different again. I mean, there's a certain amount of outright fraud, seems to be, especially in the medical field, but the one I looked at most closely, there's a fine book on that too, Cold, The Cold Fusion Affair, the belief that you could actually, in a chemical laboratory, by electrolysis, fuse some um, deuterium. Why I'd say that's pathological is they didn't have a control cell with normal water, and apart from some of their other behaviour, the, um, did, they didn't achieve fusion, um, fortunately for them, the neutrons would have killed them if they had. Uh, Slightly differently, what I call excessive exuberance. I wouldn't go to Alan Greenspan's words, irrational exuberance, but when people get an exciting initial result but ultimately isn't confirmed, and my examples are mostly from physics, but poly water, super heavy, super heavy elements, free quarks, gravitational waves, some of the ones. Um, next level down is fads. Mathematics, it's perfectly valid, perfectly applicable to small domain. People rush off and claim it's universally, universally applicable. Uh, I don't know, 20, maybe I'm getting old, 30 years ago. Um, hold on, yeah, catastrophe theory was very, very trendy. Um, it's certainly relevant to a bunch of things. Uh, chaos, um, so he said James Glyke's book wouldn't, if he called chaos, wouldn't have sold as much if he called it sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, Self-organised criticality, a so-called Sandpile model, prompted a book, How Nature Works, which I think is a rather excessive claim. But um, these different things aren't the ones I really want to use. To talk. I don't think that Gaia should be evaluated in those. I think we need to talk about it in terms of real scientific um, arguments. The three that I draw on briefly are uh, the question of whether the Cretaceous tertiary extinctions of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago were the result of an asteroid impact. That was certainly, early in my career, a contentious proposal. Um, I don't think it was subject to the level of outright abuse that some of the other theories have been subjected to, but it was certainly contentious. And um, Actually identifying the location of the impact crater helped a bit. 
Uh, the question of whether the um, ozone hole was due to solar variations, dynamical fluctuations, fluctuations in the atmosphere, or a chemical cause. Again, early in my career, um, very much a subject of real scientific debate and primarily resolved by measuring it flying um, the R2, which is basically renamed U2 spy plane, uh, into the Antarctic vortex, um, measuring the chemistry, um, which resolved it. Again, a fine book um, by Maureen Christie, who's done as a PhD in this university, again, published by Melbourne University Press as a book, talking about, from the history of, and philosophy of science perspective, how that debate really played out, and also pointing out that a political debate uh, spun off that using the same old discredited ar sorry, arguments that are long after they've been discredited scientifically. And the third one is, I want to touch on briefly, is continental drift, which ultimately morphed into plate tectonics. So it was accepted in a form rather different from what um, Alfred Wegener proposed in the 1920s. And I think this type of um, thing is more realistic to do the comparisons when talking about Gaia, that if you're going to evaluate it seriously as science, how does it shape up relative to other scientific contests? Um, again, I want to give examples. Thomas Huxley said, famously spoke, a beautiful theory slain by an ugly fact. I think I've got that right. Um, the reality is that a discrepancy often isn't really fatal. It just means you're misinterpreting stuff. Certainly in the carbon cycle field, we had in the early 90s a really large discrepancy ultimately resolved by realisation that people were talking about two slightly different things that uh, half the techniques were calculating one, half the techniques were calculating the other, and when you did a conversion, the whole thing started to fit together. But it certainly puzzled people for a um, few years. Yeah, would have loved to have been the guy who suddenly woke up to what the solution was, but I wasn't. Um, the gaps and discrepancies, you've got to, as a scientist, you have to take them seriously, but not necessarily panic. Um, thinking in terms of Darwinian evolution, which wasn't one of my examples, Darwin in particular, and a number of critics, but Darwin, Darwin's certainly worried about it, was the thought that um, if a new variety arose, it would be diluted by blending uh, through the um, mating through successive generations, and you wouldn't have a long-term benefit. It would all just be washed out. And it was only Mendel's uh, result, uh, result and later rediscovery of this, realising that the dilution is in proportions in the population that some of the descendants will actually carry the full benefit and some won't, and the ones that carry the full benefit, therefore, will be the ones that survive if it's beneficial or fail to survive if it's um, harmful. But so that realisation of how actually inheritance works in terms of a, um, a choice rather than a blending was vital. What it meant is that essentially most of Darwin's arguments could survive unchanged. It was just implicit in his view. In terms of the challenges to go, I think the confrontation of why people tend to react really comes down to a very small number of words, uh, which I've highlighted there. The guy is like a living organism whose goal is to maintain the planet and state of life. Now, next thing I actually lifted um, from Sydney Block's lecture, and I've slightly added to it, that colourful metaphor analogy can't help us confirm or refute the ideas. You have to ultimately go back and ask, what is he really saying? Um, and the obvious comparison, one that jumps out, is the selfish gene. Uh, on the surface, this sounds like a highly non-Darwinian concept, and yet when you read what Dawkins is actually saying, this is ultra-Darwinian. It's as Darwinian as you can get right down to the gene level. So you have to go a little bit beyond the words and the analogies. Um, Lovelock's defence on the lifelike is that it's actually rather difficult to define life, um, a physicist would talk about in terms of locally creating order, entropy reduction, if you want to be technical. Um, a biologist would talk about reproduction. Lovelock points out that the physicist definition would include a refrigerator as being alive, and the biologist definition would exclude worker ants who don't reproduce as not being alive. So um, Lovelock's view is to say, right, well, physiological self-regulation is a... Um, key characteristic of living organisms, and that's the one he really wants to make the analogy with and doesn't care so much about the others. More challenging one 
is the meaning of the word goal. And this has led to a number of people, in particular James Kirshner at Berkeley, saying that you will let, really people are talking about several different things. This is actually, um, I think he came up with the term strong and weak guy, uh, Paul Crutzen, who got the um, Nobel Chemistry Prize for his work on ozone depletion, uh, wrote a review he described as optimising Gaia, uh, life, making the system optimal for life. These are from how do you define optimal? Homeostatic Gaia, the self-regulation um, or co-evolutionary Gaia that life in the universe, the um, chemical and physical environment change together. Now, so Crutzen's view is, yeah, number three is unexceptional, but it's not really new. Um, but in a sense, I think that's a little unfair that back in 1965, this was a rather more revolutionary idea. It doesn't mean that Lovelock was the only person who thought of it. There was some work going back to um, Vladimir Verdansky in 1925 even, but that in a sense, even at number three, Lovelock was a bit out ahead of the majority of scientists working in what became a linked science of the Earth system. The other thing, I, well, point where I think Crutzen's being a little unfair is he just links one and two together as being too much the same. Well, I would make a distinction. I think two is plausibly... I think one is... I cannot see how one would possibly be true. I think two could be, based on some work I'll talk about briefly later. And the by lumping one and two together as what he calls healing Gaia, I, and then throwing that away, I think, is not quite a valid argument, but whatever. Lovelock's words on this, as I think I said earlier, um, there's a fair degree of ambiguity in many places on what Lovelock writes, so not, don't say this in a hostile manner. I think he's um, an innovative thinker. Uh, lots of people I regard as highly innovative thinkers doesn't mean I believe every word they say. And um, in Lovelock's case, not um, upset that he's canvassing a range of different views, uh, whether or not he's clear that he's how much he's shifting from time to time. That this is actually, um, full thing it was actually referring to the Amsterdam conference, I shortened it to finish the slide. Uh, felt they hadn't learned how ambiguous it was to speak of self regulation without specifying uh, the aim, goal, or set point. Or set point's what mathematicians will call a fixed point, um, point about which a system regulates. And for me, the question is, is he really saying those things are the same? Because it's just alternative words. Because if he is, then just saying your set point or fixed point is a rather specialised use of the term goal, I think. And that um, fixed points I can go along with goals uh, needs to be challenged rather more what he means. Um, but if he only means set point, then sure. So. Um, uh, given that's probably Lovelock's last book. He thinks it was very much written as though it was going to be his last book. We may never actually know on that one.